Hello. Hi. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Isn't this crazy all the way to the West Coast? Well, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> Sitting across from you, I'm going to tell you right now, is a privilege and an honor. What it is saying, a woman? privilege and an honor. Okay. Um, one word that you would use to describe yourself. Ebullient. Ebullient. Why, why that word? Because it's my nature. I never used to be like this, but I, I, I have come to appreciate every little moment. Describe, describe, you said you weren't always like that. Describe who the little girl was. Oh, the little girl Rosita Dolores Alverio was fearful, um, felt very unworthy, felt without value. Hmm. Uh, not necessarily my mom's fault. It was the fault of the times that anybody who came from Puerto Rico was not a good person. And I learned that very, very early. And I learned it too well. How did you, what was the first time you learned that, that you remember? I think I was five when uh, my mom had brought me to America. We lived in New York City and uh, in, in the ghetto, Hispanic ghetto. And on the way to kindergarten, I know this that little gangs of white boys were just gathered there, it seems, to uh, tease and, and uh, make deeply unhappy little girls, mostly little girls, who pass by on the way to school and say bad names. And they were very scary. And you it, just it, tucked it away. Yeah. Tucked it away. And the trouble with tucking is that it sits there and festers, and you wonder why. Why do I feel so bad about myself? Huh. So this little girl who had all these feelings had a spark in her. She loved to perform. Like, what was it about the experience of performing oh, that turned the lights on That's for easy you? to answer. Uh -huh. uh, Grandpa in Puerto Rico, Abuelo, used to uh, have me dance to records. Remember records? Of course. I used to love to boogie, you know, and shake my little tush. <laughs> And he would hug me and kiss me, and everybody in the family would say, isn't she adorable? And I thought, this is nice. I could do with more of this, truly. Did you like being Hispanic? Not for a long time. Once I came to America, yeah. I perceived that it was not a good thing to be Hispanic. And for years and years and years, I battled that. How, so how did you, did you try to hide it? I did tried you... very much to hide it. I tried to be very American. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to be up to date in things, whatever mm -hmm. that happened to be, whether it was fashion or little funny sayings that Americans would make up, you know. And you chose um, a career that would put you into the spotlight. So that would highlight again. But I didn't who... know that. Ah. I didn't know that. Uh, All I knew was I want to be Elizabeth Taylor. That's what you thought? Yeah, we yeah. were the same age, more yeah. or less. Yeah. And she was beautiful yeah. beyond reason. I thought it was entirely possible. Mm -hmm. You know, until, until people tell you when you're young that it can't be, you believe it can. So you, th you, you wanted to be Elizabeth Taylor, you wanted to be on stage, on screen, and it started happening for you. But you, again, you know, you had a name that your agent thought was not going to work. <laughs> he, he was like, uh-uh, not this name. So the, the casting director at MGM, mm -hmm. where I was under contract, said, uh, Rosita Alverio? He said, no, no. He says, that's too Italian. Rosita Alverio, okay. So he said, we got to change your name. We finally settled. He said, who's your favorite actress at that time? And I said, uh -huh. Rita Hayworth. He said, We'll call you Rita. And he said, that last name really sucks. I said, my stepfather's last name, Moreno. Uh. So that's what it became, Rita Moreno. So you were getting parts, and you were getting a lot of roles, but the roles seemed to have a common thread. Yeah. The thread was... Native girls. Yes. At first, it was great. Anything would be good. Sure. Anything. I'd be in a movie. Everything was new and yeah. thrilling and delightful. And I looked prettier than I'd ever looked because the makeup was perfect. Mm -hmm. And then more and more, I kept having to uh, learn how to do accents. And, and, and the makeup got darker and yeah. darker and darker. And all because of my name. 
And I began to see a pattern emerge, and it began to get make me very sad. And there was no way that I knew to make that turn around. Because it was Island American girl, Indian girls, right. Island girls, a it, little always immoral. illiterate. They didn't know how to speak. They had yeah. to have accents that nobody even taught me. And so I, they would all sound like this, even if they were Egyptian. They would sound Puerto Rican. <laughs> what did that do? When you were cast in those roles and you realized, this is the box I'm in, this yeah. is the box I'm in, right. what did it do to your soul, your self-esteem? Uh, it was really seriously at risk. And as I began to see that the girls I always had to play were Ill always illiterate, uh, they always had accents, they always had dark skin, but you know, I was so naive. Mm -hmm. I was really, I was that little Bronx girl mm -hmm. that said, they said, you know, you want to sit in the mud here and, you know, put it on your face. Okay. okay. Whatever you ask. I don't to like do. the way it feels, but okay. It sounds like that thread of just saying, okay, yeah. happened in your career as well when it was, um, you know, sexual harassment obviously was rampant in Hollywood. Oh. But when you're young and naive and just all you want to do is be accepted. Right. You were like, the, the, the perfect prey for some of these men. I had a studio head. I was like 21 or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, he took one look at me and he thought, ooh, yum, yum. I was really afraid. This is what's so sad about me then. I was deeply afraid that I might get talked into having an affair with him, huh. that I would get talked into by him simply because he was so powerful. Hmm. Not because I wanted a break in films or anything, nothing like that, mm. but because he would just overpower me. I was really scared to death that I'd somehow allow myself to get trapped. When those things happened to you in Hollywood, and they did, how did you emerge? The only thing that saved my life, I, I know it, and I say this in my documentary, uh, was psychotherapy. Yeah. It was Marlon Brando, with whom I had a eight-year on-off relationship, who said to me one day, you really need help. Hmm. You need to see someone. Was, was he, at that point, or as you reflect on your life, was he the love of your life? Oh, he was the lust of my life. Marlon Brando was the lust of your life. My husband was the love of my life. Hmm. Marlon was the lust of my life. Mm -hmm. And that part of it was exceptional. <laughs> I, I, you know, oh, wow, that was incredible. And he was, he was really also a very interesting man. He was yeah. very funny. Mm -hmm. Humor has always meant a great deal to me. Mm -hmm. humor, humor to me is sexy. Mm -hmm. Why is it sexy? Because I always think that a man who can be fast on his feet with humor can protect me. I mean, to read about and to learn about your love, your lust for Marlon Brando at that time. Yeah that was so intense that it oh. actually drove you at one point. To take pills to try to do away with my life. That's right. That just took my breath away, Rita. Yeah, it took, nearly took mine away as well, permanently. He kept um, disappointing me. But you know, let's put things in proper perspective. You, you let things happen, all right? People don't aren't just mean to you if you keep letting them disappoint you and hurt you, then there's something wrong with this relationship, mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. The straw that broke the camel's back, mm -hmm. as they say, this one deception, this hundredth deception, was in his bed, mm -hmm. asleep, and I thought, I can't do this to myself anymore. Mm. I, I just can't do this. I felt so humiliated. And I went to his bathroom and looked in the... Uh, medicine cabinet and he took sleeping pills now and then mm -hmm. and I just stared at it for almost a half hour and then I'd go back and then I'd come back to the I mean it wasn't something impulsive Wow! in that sense. It took thought. It took a long time wow. because I thought if you're going to do this this is forever. This, this is going to be your last breathing moment and I was in tears and I finally opened the bottle and put, I think, about 10 pills in my uh, hand and swallowed them. 
and I'm looking in the cabinet mirror all the time and saying, see, that wasn't so difficult. Oh, my God. Oh, it was, it was just horrific. Mm. And, you know, luckily his assistant, Alice, found me. Mm. But I was close. Wow. I was close. Wow. God, I mean, I'm glad that's in the, in the past. I am, I am too. When most people say your name, they immediately think West Side Story. Uh, Nobody worked harder for a part than you did. I had an audition in every aspect of that part. And uh, before I left the last audition, which was the acting one, that were, they were very pleased with, uh, he said, now, you know, we have to do the uh, dance audition. And he said, I have to tell you honestly, if you can't cut that, you don't get the part. Oh, jeez. So I ran to the local dancing school and took lessons all day long. I could barely afford it. Jeez. But I was in that dancing school like from 9 to 6 in the evening to the point where one dance teacher said to me, don't come back to my class. He said, honey, you work so hard, you turn a funny shade of purple. She said, and I don't want anything to happen to my class. <laughs> So you she said, you're for out. Her. Bye. And I remember going to yeah. the bathroom, the uh -huh. ladies' room, and looking in the mirror, and sure enough, I was the color of oh, your outfit. That's how hard you worked? It goes beyond red. I know you want the part. I get it. Yeah. But what drove you to that? I really felt it was my last chance to get something and do something that was meaningful. And I wanted that part so badly mm. I could taste it. Mm. And I knew... I knew I could do it just as <laughs> I just knew that I would be a wonderful Anita if they just give me, because I was Anita. Fast forward to Oscar night, your face when they announced your name. <laughs> and you know what I loved about that moment? I mean, it was your moment, but it was not just your moment. Oh, I love you for saying that. It was that. not just your moment. It was my people. It was your people's moment. Yes. Oh, my God. They cheered in Harlem. They oh, cheered they all went over. Crazy. I have a girlfriend <laughs> who told me that she, was, she lived in Harlem at the time. Yeah. And she says, normally it's a raucous place. When he came up to say Best Featured Actress, she said the place went dead quiet. You know what that is in the ghetto? That's amazing. It's weird. Maybe it's the end of the earth, of the earth or something. And he announced my name, and the place went up in mm. smoke, my oh. neighborhood. People yelling out the windows, she did it, she did it. And, you know, as a friend of mine said, what they were really saying was, we did it. Oh, God, that makes me want to we cry. We did it. Fast forward to this moment in time. You got to witness another beautiful... Anita. Anita bring home an Oscar. I was just, I was, I, but I'm not, I wasn't surprised. You weren't? No. Oh, no. Yeah. I kept hinting to her and I thought I shouldn't be doing this, yeah. but I thought, how can she not? And then the reviews were insane <laughs> for her, as they were for me. I gave her every bit of support that I could. Don't think that I wasn't envious. I was. You're so honest. I but love it. But what I loved about her being cast in it was Stephen picking an Afro-Latina mm -hmm. in the role. There are tons of us around. She's remarkable. However, she's working all the time. Uh -huh. I'm not. Yeah, you didn't get work for seven years or oh, so goodness, after. I could get some if I wanted to do more gang stuff mm -hmm. on a much lesser scale. But I suddenly thought, maybe I'm just not being represented correctly. Mm -hmm. So with his permission, my agent who was at William Morris, I made an appointment with another agent at William Morris. She said, so what do you, what do you want? And she was kind of tough and mm -hmm. to the point. And I said, well, I was wondering, and it was this kind of thing. Yeah. I was wondering if uh, maybe, uh, maybe you might be interested in handling my career for mm -hmm. a while. And there was an instant and harsh no. And then I said, can I ask why not? Mm -hmm. She said, you won't believe this. I can't believe anybody would say this. She says, because I don't think you have what it takes. Oh Tell my you, God. the blood just drained from my head into, into a little pool around my ankles. And I said, 
thank you. <laughs> I said, thank you. How I didn't manage to burst into tears How? at that time, I don't know. I mean, I first of all, you had won the Oscar and, and when the, she said that? And the, uh, and the uh, Golden Globe. To emerge from that and to come out after that and still grab yourself a Tony and grab yourself a Grammy in spite of that, like, that's inspirational. Like, how do you keep getting up? You just do. Because you know you're talented. I do. Yeah. I actually, I've always believed, even at my most humble, and I was, let mm -hmm. me tell you, really humble, mm -hmm. uh, I always believed that I had good stuff and that I was talented, that I needed someone. And I was so right. I needed someone to believe in me. Mm. But I never had that person. Not only did you win the Oscar, you're the first Latina to I win the... I have them all. You got the EGOT. I have the EGOT. The Emmy. Emmy what's that? Uh, Grammy, Grammy. Oscar. Oscar Tony. Tony. And then the the uh, the one that really surprised me was the uh, oh my gosh which one the uh, the Peabody yes you got the Peabody it's, it's crazy I mean this is I wish you, my mom were here <laughs> you know it's you win all these awards when you gave your Tony acceptance speech you acknowledged not just who you had become but who you were you acknowledged Rosita. You oh. acknowledge. Well, I said that's right. Yes. I forgot that. I said, I'm, not only am I proud, yes. but Rosita Dolores Alverio is yes. beside herself. Yes. Or something like that. Yes. Yes. That was, I just thought that was such a huge moment because it, you had not left anything behind, not that you ever did, mm -hmm. but to stand on stage and speak it out loud was something precious, I thought. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, you're killing me. <laughs> Will you marry me if I propose? <laughs> I'll be good to you. I'll make your breakfast even. <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> you know what I was wondering? You talk about the little you, the little girl in you. That's right. I call her little Rosita. Little Rosita. She's the one who still lives in me. You know, everybody thinks that once you've had therapy, everything is swell. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. There's still a little, there's something in me. I call her little Rosita who is always there to say, ha, 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 I told you, I told you. Told and you what? I told you you could make it. I told you you couldn't do it. I told you you'd be embarrassed. All that, that lives in me. Mm. And as I say in the documentary, the measure of being uh, mature mm -hmm. is my ability now to send her to her room. Go to your room. And you're still but sending she's still her off. There. I don't think I'm completely healed, and I don't think I will ever be. Mm -hmm. I think I'm fragile in certain ways, still. Hmm. Very, very sensitive. I love that you never got hard. It could That's do it. not in me. I, I, you know, I, I thank God for that because, yeah. honestly, I see a lot of people get that way. Because mm -hmm. I'm surprised with all, that, all the blows you took. I remember thinking once when I was doing nightclubs in Vegas, and very often the, the audience would get up and stand up, and that's before it became the thing to do. And uh, I remember going to my room, flush with all that, and the dressing room was so quiet, mm. and there was nothing there for me except my husband calling and saying, how are you tonight, how did it go? Mm. And I realized that then. I remember having a moment, an epiphany, as it were, that huh. I was very lucky. Huh. Wow. Lenny was with you for years. 46 years. 46 years. Yeah. You got the career and you got the guy. Most times you choose. Well, I got the guy, but then it turned into not a happy marriage mm. because I felt that, uh, you know, it's what I say. I, I don't want to repeat myself, but it's what I say in the documentary. People make deals with each other that are never verbalized. Mm -hmm. and, and I was really also afraid that uh, I would not be good on my own. So you on your own, your own voice, your own choices, your own decisions, nobody's putting their thumb on the scale, nobody's telling you what to do. Mm -hmm. How did you adjust to that life? Being on my own? Yeah. It was easy. <laughs> It was easy, yeah. and it was it actually it uh, it worried me because I came back. His 
uh, his demise happened in New York when mm -hmm. I was in the hospital with him for about a month and a half, mm -hmm. sleeping on one of those hideous cots mm -hmm. where you can feel the floor. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and I came home. I remember it was a beautiful sunny afternoon, and my assistant was there, Judy. Mm -hmm. And I said, give me a big glass of white wine. Mm. And I sat in my very pretty courtyard, and I just took in the sun, and I thought, I'm free. Mm. I can do anything I want now. Mm. Anything. You know what I'm struck by, what, what I find so inspiring in this conversation, is your directness, your honesty. You say all the hard parts out loud. But you know you have to. You have to, particularly if you're in my business, which is full of lies and deception. For your own mental health, I think you have to be truthful. So as we sit here at 90 years old, what inspires you now? Like what kinds of things inspire you? Women. Yeah. Women. I, I, uh, I have such an appreciation, a deep appreciation of women and what they have to go through mm -hmm. to be uh, successful in life. And that doesn't mean stars. Mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean the head of corporation. Just handling their lives mm -hmm. and being a parent. Mm -hmm. That takes enormous amount of work. And it's about time that we support it. See, I, that's what I love so much, mm -hmm. that we are supporting each other. Well, you've been marching and you've been fighting the good fight from the very beginning. You were there when Dr. Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech. There are life-changing moments. not more than 15 feet away from him watching him do that speech. The Why was it important that you were there during that I Have a Dream speech? Because it, it settled for me once and for all that I had a responsibility, mm. that I had advantages that many, many people didn't. And I'd been there when I didn't, mm -hmm. so I understood very well. Mm -hmm. I understood what this struggle was about. Mm -hmm. I just want to think about your cool life and the things you've, not just the things you've witnessed, but the things you've participated in. Do you, do you know at this point that you are, that you're worthy of everything you've achieved and everything? Well, I certainly feel that I've earned yeah. everything mm -hmm. that is wonderful and yeah. good and a reward. Yeah. I absolutely feel that I, that has not, I, it has not come cheaply. Mm -hmm. I've had to earn every bit of that, yeah. and I'm very proud of that. And lastly, um, you've, uh, as I keep repeating, you've changed the lives of so many people. Countless you'll never know. That's a, Most it's you'll astounding. never know. It's astounding. Um, what is it? <gasps> oh, I've got to tell, tell you something Tell me. Else. I want to know. <laughs> I had done a television interview, and I talked about my attempt at suicide. Yeah. About a year later, I was walking into the lobby of the Waldorf Astoria in New York, and I see somebody across the lobby, which mm -hmm. is huge, go. Mm -hmm. So I walked toward them, and they ran toward me, and they held my hands, and they were in tears. It was a man. And he said, thank you. Huh. Oh, this is hard. He said, thank you. You saved my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. And uh, that's when I thought, I, I just have to help in any way that I can. So, you know, words do have meaning. And when you mm. have people playing mm. with them and saying dreadful, untrue things, mm. it's heartbreaking. Well, you're a healer. You know what? I think I am. I think I am. A healer. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we need Kleenexes <laughs> on aisle one. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Find your favorite recipes, celebrity interviews, uplifting stories, shop our favorite deals, and so much more with the Today app. Download it now.